we're already uh, you know importing sand from all over the world at a very high price sand has become a very expensive commodity and it's it's very necessary to to uh to uh fuel the the construction that we need in our state to keep up with population growth and and we have this commodity sitting in the, in the bottom of our reservoirs and nobody really has talked about whether it's it's a good idea or at least it's feasible it may be profitable to go in and dredge our reservoirs and increase the capacity of them at the same time get a product to within the the surrounding area of the reservoir for to to uh get get this product to the people that that need it so it might be a a way of very inexpensively in creating uh creating uh, increasing the capacity of, of our reservoirs do you have any thoughts on that is that something that you intend um, uh, intend to look into is that Am I way off in terms of? I might just comment more based on my previous experience at the department than BDCP. We're not looking at those issues directly, but the the reservoirs in the Sierra Nevada and the and the coast range and the Cascades tend to be uh, on granitic rock or volcanic rock and accumulate very little sediment. in In the uh, some of the drought years in the '90s. Uh, when the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, for example, uh, in Yosemite National Park was, uh, oh, if you looked around, <laughs> <laughs> just giving an example here, <laughs> uh, that reservoir was lowered greatly because of the drought, and it was astounding to see how little sediment came into it because the granite rock in, in Yosemite produces very little sediment. It's 70 years, 80 years old. Uh, and similarly, uh, Oroville Reservoir, which is in a somewhat more erosive area, uh, during some previous droughts it was seen that far less than 1% of the reservoir had filled in over the 50 years it's been around. So in those areas, uh, there hasn't been too much of a need. In the coast range, however, we've had amazing sedimentation filling in dams right up to the top in some cases. Sedimenting. Uh, the, well, the Ringe Dam, uh, Malibu Creek on the uh, Carmel River, Mad River, the Eel River, all of those have dams that have literally filled up or almost filled up. And uh, you're right. There is material in there that can be used. The problem is how to safely get it out. You don't want to cause any disaster downstream when you empty those reservoirs. And so it's, it becomes expensive to either take it out by truck or find a way to sluice it out. But it is a reservoir. It is a resource that can be used, but in a localized way, because no really large reservoirs yet have been impacted by sediment in California. Unlike other states, where they have much more serious problems. So you're right about it, but it's really a coast range phenomenon, pretty much. Do you have more, Mr. Weiss? Uh, Ms. Yamada. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly want to again acknowledge my good colleague Senator Wolk here, and assume that she may also have we'll a little that. time. Sure. Thank you. Um, I have a question or comment for each of you, actually, so I'm going to start with Dr. Merrill. Thank you uh, again for uh, your references to both the Yolo Basin and the Sassoon Marsh, um, since uh, we uh, proudly represent those two areas and very critical to continuing the discussion and sort of reestablishing or restoring some trust in the process. Uh, it's very heartening, as I mentioned to Secretary Laird, to hear um, the change in direction. Uh, and I might say that as you work towards that agreement with Yolo County, uh, you know, I don't know if it's Supervisor Mike McGowan or Supervisor Jim Provenza or the whole board that you're working through, but, you know, since Supervisor McGowan uh, initially referred to the BDCP as the Big Dumb Canal Project, um, you know, I hope we can fast forward now to ensure that uh, there is, you know, maybe a, 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 a change in the um, in the relationship, and we have to really work hard uh, to to do that. And again, pledge that assistance to you. Um, for uh, the conservancy director, who I have not had the opportunity to meet, I did want to. Uh, respond maybe to the fact that you do not still have an assembly uh, representative. Um, I know that, and I'm going to shift over also to Mr. Machado, that uh, the speaker has just appointed uh, Joan Buchanan as the assembly representative to the Delta Protection Commission. That seat unfortunately remained vacant from December 2008 from, from the time Senator Wolk went over to the Senate. So I'm glad to hear that that appointment has been made. And again, uh, you know, would hope that uh, we can work towards um, having a representative uh, for you to work with. Maybe it will be Assemblymember Buchanan as well. I don't know. 
Um, but I know Senator Wolk will, will continue her support of both the Commission and the Conservancy. Um, I did want to ask a little bit of a follow-up question on the Watermaster. Uh, if you, um, from, the, from your perspective, give us a little bit more information about some of the day-to-day -day activities that the Watermaster is engaged in. Certainly, um, and um, I certainly can't substitute for the Watermaster speaking to this um, himself. But uh, the Watermaster does have a small staff, and they are currently actively engaged within the Delta area itself in working with um, the various water right holders to educate them on requirements specifically. There's been a lot of concern about our new requirements as a part of SB1 um, for filing of statements of diversion and use. So they've been putting on workshops and educating um, water right holders throughout the Delta region. Um, the Watermaster is um, engaged in enforcement actions, um, reviewing potential um, investigations or cases and making determination if within the context of um, what is happening in the Delta, those actions should be moved forward. Um, the Watermaster as well is working with various parties on um, broader water right actions and um, has also um, prepared um, a couple of reports, both of which are available on our website. Um, the first one was perhaps a bit more controversial. Mm -hmm. um, the second report is a summary of um, what authority exists as it relates to the activity that we're here meeting about today. Um, so I think that the Watermaster is involved in all activities related to the Delta and the State Water Board is asked that the Watermaster update the Water Board on his activities um, every other month. And so coming up this month, and we can certainly make um, the date and time available to your staff, the Watermaster will be providing a report to the board, the State Water Board, on his activities. And so we can certainly provide you with that information. Thank you very much. And I'm going to save, I guess, my last question for Mr. Eisenberg. Um, you know, frankly, well, our, our history uh, from a couple of years ago um, was not that positive, obviously, since uh, we had some differences of opinion on uh, how the Delta Stewardship Council uh, was actually established and the broad authority and really the very central authority um, that the Stewardship Council has over an area that is very dear to all of our hearts. I, I did want to uh, just on the side say that your comments about Sacramento um, don't really reflect uh, hopefully the, the whole view of the Sacramento region in terms of our interest in sharing the water in a fair and balanced way. But my, my specific question to you today is, is really, frankly, in the face of the withering criticism uh, that we just read about from from the federal agency or you know the the, the science uh, agency uh, that uh, just came out uh, just several days ago. I know you alluded to that a little bit in your opening presentation, but how are we going to really you know address the restoration of trust at the stewardship council level? I think slowly we are gaining that trust in the delta area with some of the other agencies. But frankly, since you hold the cards on this at the Stewardship Council level, uh, I just wanted to know how you're going to uh, wave your magic wand and, and make that trust uh, well, I'm happy uh, to know I, I hold the cards. I didn't know that. Uh, but <laughs> well, but I take you, you at you, your you, word. And well, generally you, hold them above the table, too. <laughs> which is, uh, uh, well, for, first of all, on the uh, uh, the uh, National Research Council and the Academy's report, it's it's relatively short. Uh, maybe the committee would like to circulate it to members. I think it's worth reading. Although fundamentally, it's directed at BDCP. It's it it did, however, raise the other question of whether the co-equal goals are state policy, and of course, co-equal also includes the sentence about the Delta. And it either is or it isn't. And that is a co that's the same comment we raised last year in a communications with BDCP, uh, I mean, with the Department of Water Resources, the lead agency in that activity. And so from my viewpoint, um, I, I think Dr. Merrill's comments and Secretary Laird's comments are probably more supportive of the notion that co-equal goals are a guiding principle uh, than, uh, than has been previously articulated. And maybe that'll go ahead and do it. But 
you know, one of the things that I thought was most interesting in the report was not just their discussion of science and adaptive management, which is the fo many ways the focal point of their report. They did a terrific six-page backgrounder on just water policy and problems in California. Uh, that uh, it's no surprise to anyone you can find it echoed in, in many other publications, but it's helpful to occasionally put it one place at one time in relatively short format, particularly by first-rate scientists, an overview position on water and, uh, and ecosystem and the delta. And I would commend that to, to your attention. Uh, we cannot remedy BDCP unless Dr. Merrill tells us that we can order them around. Uh, I didn't read that in the statute. We, we have used our responsible agency role to give them some opinions of ours. They're going to respond. I thought the comment today about removing the loyalty oath was particularly significant. Uh, I thought the we're, comment... We're a little familiar with loyalty oaths yes. in our community. Yeah, well, aren't we all? <laughs> and uh, uh, and I thought the uh, the notion about the uh, transparency of the process was important, uh, although I predict that no matter what uh, Mr. Laird or, or Dr. Merrill says, that somebody is going to say it's not enough. I predict that with a high level of certainty. Yeah. Having said that, the Delta Plan is fueled and driven by the co-equal goals. That's the statutory mandate to us. And we will, to the extent of our skills and ability and responsibility, pursue that and aggressively. But we're not, um, contrary to all the commotion, uh, if I had my own way, this w the Delta Plan would be a much uh, <laughs> stronger document than it is. But we're carefully reading the law, and that's why I carry it around all the time and look at it. And I, uh, I don't think we have an obligation to go farther than the law allowed us to do, although the chairman periodically lectures me about uh, pushing the envelope, testing the edge, and I say, God, leave you me alone, Mr. Chairman. You don't need lecturing on that, Bill. Uh, that's good. Th th this, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Assemblywoman, this is this is just a damnably complex issue, uh, and uh, there's so many other factors involved that it's hard to get your handle on it. One thing we've learned over the last 50 years, you can't just address one s element of the problem and expect success. That we're confident about that. That's why multiple things have to be done. The problem is everybody's only in favor of some of the multiple things, and. That, that, that's the art form that, that all of you elected officials uh, have to express. You did it with the co-equal goals. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, not perfect, but pretty good. And uh, hopefully the Delta plan will inch forward on this stuff, move ahead, try to set with some clarity what's out there. Will there be disagreements? You bet. Will we review every five years as we must? Of course. Of course. This is under change. Last word on the scientist. The scientists are in increasingly uh, resistant to my demands and others uh, to predict with certainty that particular actions can save a species and do this and do that. And uh, I, I should tell you one story that I thought was great. I was I was hectoring them as as an only an ex legislator could. These are our scientists about, by God, if we did this habitat and did this restoration, why can't we just guarantee? And the, one of the uh, lead scientists for the interagency ecological program, really smart lady, looked at me and said, you can't guarantee it because you're not God. And I thought that was, I thought that was one of the most interesting and sobering and honest and true statements in the business. One I don't want to hear because, you know, legislative business is guaranteeing things in statute. They said, sir, there's some things you can't guarantee. You work. You can test them. You've got to get back and test them again. And, you, you know, by, you don't, you're not God just by writing a Delta plan, and I don't think that either. Well, thank you. I, thank you. I did want to uh, make one final comment that uh, I was thinking that since the Dalai Lama is now retiring from day-to-day -day activity, you know, I think I referenced having the Dalai Lama be our water master at one point. But, uh, you know, uh, and I, I do want to acknowledge the, the great complexity and difficulty that you face and the many years of your service um, to this effort. But uh, I do hope that we will uh, ensure that, you know, the Delta voices and those who represent the Delta are fully included in the discussions. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, to the south end of the Delta, Mr. Barry Hill, and brace yourself for a question about Delta corridors. I, I did not bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Although, now that you mention it, <laughs> size does matter. And I think, I think as, you, as you look at uh, the bigger projects, you also look at longer time frames. And to go to Dr. Haldeman's point uh, of the problems down south, as we look at the very what some would consider the big fix, I think uh, that becomes problematic in getting water delivered in a shorter amount of time. And so that's all I'm going to say on Delta Quarters. Um, <laughs> Dr. Merrill, uh, in, in the issues you talked about going forward on, I, I didn't hear you mention anything on dredging. Are, are you guys looking at dredging issues at all? And The uh, dredging issues under a lot of jurisdictions, uh, Corps of Engineers, EPA, State Water Board, and of course uh, the various flood control agencies because you change the flood capacity of the channels. We really don't have a flood responsibility at BDCP. We, we have to be careful not to affect the flood capacity of any channels in any of the projects, the habitat projects, anything conveyance. We cannot impair the flood capacity of the old bypass or any of the delta channels. But we don't have a direct responsibility to deliver a flood control product in a sense. So what we have to do in each of the alternatives is examine, including the in-delta alternative, whether we're doing anything that would hurt the flood control effort, but it, does, it falls on the Central Valley Flood Board to improve, ideally, the flood control capacity. So it's sort of multiple responsibilities, uh, but they're the primary lead on that issue, though. Okay. I want to tell you, though, that I did have a two-hour meeting with Mr. Cordopassi and heard his views very strongly <laughs> on this subject. <laughs> As have we all. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Eisenberg, uh, do you do you see any problems? I mean, I know when 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 this whole bureaucracy of the the Delta governance came together, uh, it, I mean, it just looked like a bad wiring job on a car. I mean, when you look at it and all the arrows and everything, I mean, are you seeing a problem with duplication of efforts? And is there some streamlining or anything that uh, that we as a legislature should be looking at to try to clean it up to make it more? Uh, work better? Uh, you know, the, uh, and the answer is sure, there are a lot of things you could do. But fundamentally, the real thing, is there a policy consensus on social goals? If there is, you can have the existing confusing system or any modification of it achieve the goals. But if there's nothing but a compilation of everyone's hopes, fors, and wishes and recognized in statute, you don't have a policy, you just got Wishes. I think it's the lack of policy clarification. And, and, and in fact, the tensions between the issues and the fact that human nature, you, everybody wants to win their fight. Everybody wants to protect their interest. Everyone wants to pursue their agenda. And that's, that's you, you know, your business is to try to distill and impose some kind of sense of order on the issue. Uh, I would not claim that any governmental structure or any business structure is efficient in the sense of the word, um, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's the problem. You could have just one agency all by itself mm -hmm. and without a policy agreement, ability to fund. One of the big questions we haven't talked about is we're going to go through probably three, four decades of much reduced governmental financing capacity is my hunch, certainly at the state level possibly at the federal level, that may mean we're going to return to one of those historic areas, eras where regional actions or localized actions are primary. You know, the Diamond Bar Reservoir is a regional thing. The Los Vaqueros Reservoir, that, where they just started raising it, one of the few opportunities available because it was designed and built fairly recently so the capacity is possible. It's within one jurisdiction's authority. Uh, those are the opportunities I think we're going to look for. Now, that's the problem is that lacks the pristine beauty of a clear statewide policy, but that could well be the future uh, for a number of decades until the uh, funding availability becomes more apparent. Mr. Berryhill, were you wondering specifically perhaps about funding authority for the council so that they can continue to operate after they well, finish their plan in January? As, as, as we go with, with uh, what is it, Prop 26, you know, how do you fund these how do you do your funding? Well, a, a complicated question. Others are better answered or positioned to answer, but I'll give you a couple of, of notations. Um, 
the Delta Council's work is relatively modest in the in the range of things. I mean, when you talk about operations of the State Water Project or the CVP, you're talking about gross operational costs of billions of dollars per year. Uh, you set us up to operate. We've got $5 million from the general fund and then some bond funds to hire consultants and do other stuff. 60% of what we do is the science program, Delta Science Program, the Independent Science Board, our relationship with the Indian Agency Ecological Program. I mean, that's that's the heart of what we inherited from uh, the uh, CalFed Bay Delta and what we're running now. Uh, the real question is state policy, whether it's levy work in the Delta, where the question is what what levy should the state of California be responsible for? We have this distinction, what are called project levies, where the feds are involved and we're involved. But there are non-project levies, and the folks in the Delta, Senator Wolk's constituents, uh, Mr. Mata's constituents, who who own property behind project levies, uh, non-project levies, excuse me, they say, well, you know, God, you got to kick it in. Legislature's got a discretionary pot of money, not an in entitlement program. Should the state of California expand its legal liability? That's one of the big dilemmas we face. You're familiar with the Paterno court case from Marysville, Yuba City flood of about a decade ago. The state rolled out $562 million to settle that when we, the state had returned authority over those levies to the local districts in the 1950s. We got them from the feds. We rolled them over to the locals. The locals didn't have the capacity, didn't maintain it. There's a break. Guess what? The state's to deep, deep pocket. The some policy clarification there is helpful. We're inching towards standards. You, you do see, for example, in the Delta Plan, the protection of floodplains. Floodplains are, I mean, you can't, you, you want to lower water level, the fastest way is to have a floodplain so you can open a breach and move water in there. Uh, but that, of course, conflicts with all kinds of local interest, land development interest in, in, in certain floodplain areas, Missouri. largely city now, not not unincorporated areas. All those tensions together are there, and it's the same thing on facilities, whether they're water storage or whether they're conveyance. It's a question of who pays and how much and where they are and all of that, and what you can guarantee from it. Okay, one, one more deal on sure. process. Uh, so how long will a consistency with a co-equal goal determination, mm -hmm. how long does that take place? I mean, so if you're going to determine something's a co-equal goal that meets all that, how, what is that process? Well, it's state law. It's, it's state law that the policy of the state of California is co-equal goals. That's you know, it's like any other state law. No, I think how, he's how long about a, determine a consistency, a consistency determination for a project. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. In the process. Yeah. Oh, there's an expedited process in the... Uh, uh, in the uh, consistency action, uh, agency decides it needs covered action. It wanders in. It gives us a notice. Uh, we publish the notice within, I forget, X days. We adopted rules on this last year. Uh, then any person who protests it can file a protest. Uh, we have uh, 30 days after appeal to determine, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, the appeal must be filed within 30 days. Okay. Okay. And then the council makes its decision within 60 days. So you got a 90 day. Yeah. The question is, if the information in the in the uh, application of covered action is not sufficient, can we return it? The answer is yes. And and you know and, and as a matter of fact, one of the controversies we're going through now is what's the information's required? And as you might imagine, people have different views about it. But it's a very expedited process. So if something if something is found to be consistent and all hunky dory, you finish your ninety days. What's the next step in that process? They go ahead. They go ahead with the project. project goes ahead. Now that, you understand the 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 agency has its own project rules and requirements that don't have anything to do with us. And we, just by getting uh, a certification, by the way, we set up a process where if we could certify, if there's no appeal, well, we can just certify consistency with a, uh, and, and do it informally in advance of the submission. If, if there is no uh, uh, other dispute, and I've, all big projects have endless disputes, if there is no other dispute, there's nothing here that stops. Stops the project. No, from going anywhere no. And you know, again, back to the point I, I had raised when the vice chair had, had asked this question, or maybe it was Miss Olson. I don't remember. Uh, agencies can proceed with a covered action even if we find them inconsistent. 
there's a problem. I, I don't want to tell you there, there isn't at least an argument about that. Uh, but this is a pretty light-handed approach. It's an expedited process, uh, and it ought to be. It ought to be. Uh, that, that should cover it for now. Terrific. And any of the other witnesses wish to add to what we've heard so far? I think we're reaching the end here. If not, I one, one, one last well, one certainly, Mr. Greyhill. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, th how how many months out of the year do the pumps actually run now under the restrictions? Is it like four months or something? It really depends on the water year type. Uh, in a dry year, uh, when the restrictions are very tight, there could still be a small amount of diversion, right. so they might be running at a low level. Oddly enough, in a really wet year, when you filled up everything in the south, even though there's a huge amount of water in the delta, you've lost. You no more place to put it. You have nowhere to and put so it. And so right. it just depends. It's not intuitive. You think, oh, in a wet year, you're going to pump like crazy. Actually, you Once San Luis is full, yeah. you know, in, in Kern County, they can put a million acre feet a year underground, but at some point, they can only handle so much. So there's no one pattern. I could get you, if you want to see it, the pattern of pumping over many, many years, and it would just be a remarkable yeah. set of up and downs. The, the, the pumps are operating in every month of the year, though. The question a little is bit, at probably. what capacity. A little yeah. bit, all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it behoove us, I know we've talked about above Delta storage and everything, but wouldn't it behoove us to have some type of, some more, uh, another San Luis south along that I-5 quarters? Are well, there anything? I, I've never well, seen anything proposed for that. Well, yeah, I, 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 authored, I authored the resolution that put the Los Banos Grandes potential site in the state water project when I was here, and then everyone looked at it, and they said, well, it's too small. Uh, the director of DWR flew me over in a helicopter, not a black helicopter, but a <laughs> helicopter, and he said, you know, Phil, this is not a world-class site. And I said, what's a world-class site? And it turns out it's engineer talk for big. Uh, and so nobody, you know, they, they, there were problems with it because all the new sites are relatively small. We've got 1,200 storage facilities in California, 200 relatively big ones as DWR classifies them. And so we're kind of operating on the margin. I, I, I personally think that the Los Vaqueros example of raising a facility that exists now is likely to be more intensively explored by the Water Commission. It's not BDCP's role, but by the Water Commission. Uh, and that's probably a practical uh, approach. There are problems, as you might imagine, because every downstream user of water objects to upstream storage of water that lowers what they get. That's, uh, and and there, no good deed goes unpunished. I should add, though, that I, I did a tour of Kern County recently, and they have the ability in Kern County now to take one million acre feet of water each year and put it underground, and they have a lot of yeah. unused capacity. Right. That's the size of a very San Luis reservoir. That's a very large reservoir. And we're not done in California doing those projects. There's one active one in Madera County that's been controversial, but now seems to be going forward. So there's a lot of potential for storage still in California. Using the reservoirs we already have. Right. In the, yeah, did yeah. you miss Dr. That, that just take I well. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. I think it, it bears clarifying that it doesn't matter how much we can recharge at a given time if it doesn't have a yield. Oh, yeah. for farming. And if you deliver 100% of a water allocation in October, long after the farmer has already picked which crops to grow and which fields to fallow, it actually doesn't do them a lot of good. So timing is key. This is a matter of physics and osmosis. Right now, we can't keep forcing the ground to recharge because with the recent rains, we exceeded capacity. The ground cannot take any more right now. Yeah. It's not real storage in the same way that above ground storage is. All right. Well, I think uh, I will at this point thank and uh, excuse the panel. We appreciate very much your testimony. And uh, oh, Senator Wolk, but wait, you can't get away yet. Senator Wolk uh, has the final word. Yes. I don't have. I know you put the Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have much to say. First of all, I want to thank the chair for convening the panel and for. Uh, moving this forward, um, and um, I came over because I heard um, uh, the uh, testimony of Dr. Merrill um, as to uh, what the chair rightfully drew, drew attention to the change, uh, I believe, in the administrations and, and the approach uh, to this issue, and I really do appreciate that and recognize that as well. Um, I appreciate the involvement of the local communities um, and addressing those issues. 
Uh, and now that I have just a couple of things I wanted to mention, and I'll be very brief, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Oh, um, now that the National Academy of Sciences has really put an exclamation point on the problems with the science uh, in the BDCP, uh, and just one of the sentences to quote, uh, little, it's little more than a post hoc rationalization of a previously selected group of facilities, including a canal or tunnel. I mean, the exclamation point on the science is clear. Uh, I want to know um, two things. The first is, in addition to the science issue, we have the cost issue, and that always comes second or later, and you know my concern about that, that in fact, uh, that may be a bigger hill to climb than we're acknowledging at the moment. Um, and I think it's really essential as we go through this process that the administration consider uh, the various, the costs for the various alternatives. Because I don't believe, I believe uh, Mr. Eisenberg did say um, that we're in a different era um, and uh, the issue of federal funds or state funds, uh, the willingness of the voter to accept um, any kind of bond issue uh, or vote for that, and let alone at the local level where the uh, demand for projects that have regional significance and obvious benefits is going to outweigh perhaps the uh, statewide uh, interest in uh, the Delta. Uh, I think we can't leave the, co the cost issue for the, for the end of the discussion. It would be a mistake. I, the question I have of you, though, is about the relationship between this BDCP process and the Delta plan and its deadlines. How is this going to be meshed? And if you did speak to that earlier, I'm sorry, I did not hear that. But no, I don't but, think as specifically as you just put it yeah. that it was spoken to, I but mean, that's probably a question for Mr. Eisenberg. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Merrill. You sure. Mm -hmm. We, we will adopt the Delta plan at the statutory deadline you gave us uh, in the legislation, and uh, BDCP will not be completed by that time. We've review, we are have and are reviewing all the public documents to see whether elements might be reflected in the Delta plan, as informed by the by the documents. But the statute also says when it is completed we're required to incorporate it if it meets the test of law mm -hmm. and uh, if uh, Fish and Game makes its determination and either somebody doesn't appeal to us or does and we agree with the consistency of Fish and Game determination, it'll be incorporated in the Delta plan. That will undoubtedly lead to other changes and other elements of the Delta plan. Hard to anticipate what they'd be in, until the process is completed. Uh, but we're, I mean, we're aware of it. Well, if, if I might, Senator Walk, just to sharpen this, because I think yeah. the conundrum that you're in, uh, Mr. Eisenberg, and I don't envy you this, is that you're charged with creating a plan by January of next year that includes all of these specific elements, including Delta conveyance, which was one of the things that's statutorily supposed to be included in the, in the plan. Yep. And yet, we all know the plan also envisioned the potential for BDCP stepping in and providing that element of the plan if it meets standards. BDCP is years away from being done. And you've got a deadline in January. And so I think one of the things everybody is probably scratching their head and wondering is what do you do? Do you just leave a placeholder? Do you? What, what I think, if you look at the third draft Delta plan, we've started to talk about uh, what do we call them? immediate needs. I mean, all. When we actually have a private discussion with everyone, everyone says things like, mm, no tunnel or pipe or canals ever, you know, you won't turn a spade of dirt for 15, maybe 20 years just because it's that big and that, you, get, you know, it takes that time. For a storage facility, they maybe say 10 years. Schwarzenegger, Governor Schwarzenegger used to say 10 years. What do you do in the meantime? So you focus on intermediate action. Yeah, and, and. Uh, ca ca the caution that uh, that uh, Ms. Wolk and Ms. Yamada have made that I take to heart is there will not be vast sums of public money easily available. And so I think we're headed toward the notion, in, in, and we've started to tinker with it, of the first five to ten years mm -hmm. and say what should be done to serve the co-equal goals in that time. Now, this is very preliminary, but, my my again, the state interests are fundamentally – a reliable water system. So you have to protect what's there, even if you're seeking to have something that's better. 
what those protection steps are run the range of the emergency response equipment and all that, but probably also involve other changes. You have to do some improvements on the Delta ecosystem. Hard for me to imagine that you don't start with publicly owned lands. There are at least 43,000 acres of publicly owned land in the statutory Delta now, and you start doing some of the things all the scientists tell us they want to see done, testing out island restoration approaches and, and so on. And then you try to think about steps that can be taken for the most dramatic problem, which is risk to life and property in the Delta from whatever the causes. And there, uh, this is my personal opinion, I don't know if the council will agree, I think you accelerate the establishment of a floodplain in, in, San Joaqu in South San Joaquin. It's been discussed for decades. It's politically controversial. It is from a, uh, uh, um, an engineering and a public safety point of view undeniable. And the cities are moving in on the available lands. And, you know, once you have houses there, you have the problem, and there's no way to, to, to solve it. So my hunch is we will probably have that little short-term immediate needs or some other t caption that goes with it as a way to articulate it. And if we lay out the larger policies correctly and a BDCP process uh, uh, comes in that addresses some of those concerns, maybe there's a point where collectively the political leadership, the policy-making leadership, can say, mm, this is a way we can see forward. Is it fair to say, then, that the, the focus we could expect to see would be, for at least the next five to ten years, making the existing conveyance system work with the Delta environment? Yes, uh, okay. to the extent we can. I don't want to – this is not miracles. The, the, these are not miracles. They are hard, tough decisions, and hopefully they pay tangible benefits. But this is like flood protection. Mm -hmm. You need right. – you need an insurance policy for the state water uh, system that's there, some actual spending, albeit controversial. You need something done on the ecosystem at the same time to help this process inch forward. Okay. Senator, did you? Yeah. And that would also include, would it not, Phil, um, reducing reliance on the Delta yeah. and levy, right. which we, we really didn't, there's not a whole lot in the legislation about levy protection. But if you're, in fact, you're talking about interim actions, or in, for the next 10 years, and you're talking about risk? Two, yeah, two, two things. Uh, our whole approach on regional self-reliance is tied into the statutory language, which said it's policy of the state of California to decrease reliance on the Delta for future water needs through all of these actions. Now, that's uh, reduced reliance is controversial to many people, as you might imagine, but it's, it's there. On the flood risk, uh, we have we have in very broad brush uh, strokes recommended a delta wide flood, um, we'll call it a risk management uh, assessment district for locals. This is not something I think that the state ought to run. Now the locals are, in my judgment, are both attracted and nervous about the idea, uh, for all the obvious reasons. But practicality is we need coherent planning and it's a it's a five county planning it's not individual county planning and we need some level of protection and the locals need some way to help find their cost share of any formula once hopefully the legislature determines what is a fair and reasonable state funding obligation that the governor would agree with all right well thank you uh, very much we are going to move now to some final minutes of public comment. I want to thank the panel. And, and just one last editorial comment, if I might. This was a great uh, set of witnesses to hear from in terms of checking in on policy and governance in the Delta, hearing how things are going. Uh, we didn't have unlimited time. In a perfect world, I would have also had someone from the Department of Fish and Game to remind us that as we talk about these things, there's also the fisheries uh, and the health of those fisheries and the food that those fisheries, in particular the salmon fishery, provide. The food issue cuts both ways in this debate. There is food production and jobs at issue in the Central Valley and on the coast and uh, in the Delta, absolutely. So just a piece of context for us all to consider. Public comment, um, we are going to ask, hopefully, folks, to try to keep it to a minute or so. and. I'm constitutionally challenged to strictly enforce time limits, but if you see me start to hand this to Vice Chair Halderman, uh, you will know that the, the crackdown's about to come. So uh, please proceed. Thanks.
Good late morning. Jonas Minton with the Planning and Conservation League. We are committed to a successful outcome. Uh, we're hoping for it, but we're going to offer some specifics to make that hope into reality. Six different items. First, uh, get a different funding source for the BDCP process. I'm not talking about facilities in the future. As Tom Birmingham stated at the first uh, BDC public hearing, they've spent about $150 million. They have not saved one fish. They have not uh, achieved one additional drop of water. I think those are fair comments. Uh, they've made it clear that before they want to proceed with putting up another $100 million, they're going to want assurances that they're getting something. That biases the process. If you say that the people who are mostly interested in one of the co-equal objectives are going to pay the freight for the whole effort, it skews it, and understandably. Uh, so it's not easy, but I think that's going to be a reality that hasn't been discussed yet. Second, don't prejudge the outcome, and I'm speaking to BDCP, not even the, the 3,000 CFS tunnel that we suggested be analyzed. They should all be analyzed. Once you prejudge, uh, you start screwing it up. Involve science from the beginning is the third suggestion. We heard about uh, a more inclusive process for the stakeholders. I look forward to hearing how science is going to be brought in early rather than that post hoc um, uh, justification for decision already made. Don't roll the one region in the state of California. It's very hard. You know, there are trade offs. But the concept that at the end of the day, all of the rest of the state's going to get something and the delta is just going to be on the short end of the stick doesn't work in the 21st century. Uh, don't try to jam an unrealistic schedule is the fifth. Trying to get that effects analysis out in just a few months is just going to take us back to Groundhog Day again. Openness and transparency is the last item. Um, the Delta Stewardship Council has been an excellent example of how to do that, and we hope the BDCP follows that. Thank you. Thank you for your quick comments. You can inhale now. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, I hope you'll allow me a couple minutes to explain at least who North Delta is because there are new committee members that you have. My name is Melinda Terry. I'm the manager of the North Delta Water Agency. It's approximately 300,000 acres of the Delta, so it's almost half of the legal Delta. Um, it also happens to be the place where most of um, the impact will occur. All five of the intakes, new intakes would, that are proposed will be in North Delta, 758-acre four bay and intermediate pumping plant. We don't have even power lines. So we'll actually have to bring in power lines to do some of what's proposed. Also, most of the habitat acres will occur in the North Delta, so I just want people to understand that's who we are. And finally, the North Delta Water Agency also is a water contractor. We actually have a water supply reliability um, contract with the State Water Project, DWR specifically, um, yet we are constantly excluded from the table that all the other water contractors get to sit at. And so that's all. I'll spend my other minute on just saying my frustration a little bit still is there have been, we are a member of the steering committee as well, so we did sign the agreement, we participated in good faith, yet since November, um, we have not been invited to any meetings, and um, if you listen to the Metropolitan website's April 26th um, committee on the Bay of Delta that they had, their staff did in fact describe the executive committee that previously only talked about conveyance as now being expanded to talk about policy issues and key decisions that need to be made and how refreshing it was to have that done, and I thought to myself, hmm policy issues and key decisions behind closed doors. That sounds familiar to me. Oh yeah, that was the principals group meetings that occurred last October. Mm -hmm. Now I was a steering committee member, so I got to attend those. I was not allowed to speak, but I was allowed to attend, but the rest of the public was not. So it is a little frustrating. I feel like I, we deserve a seat at the table because we are one of the water contractors. Um, and I just would point out that there are questions that I have too that really have not been answered. Um, the work groups, who are they gonna report to? Who's going to make the final decisions of the work product that may come out of these work groups? Hopefully, they will get more done than the steering committee did, did honestly. Um, and uh, um, I, I just don't know. There's more questions, frankly, than I have answers at this point, and it feels very frustrating after spending a couple of years on that process. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Yeah. Next. Um, good morning. My name is Barbara Berrigan Perea, and I'm the executive director for Restore the Delta. We are the largest glass, grassroots organization representing people in the Delta farming and fishing communities. We have over 7,000 members throughout the state. Um, 
I actually want to echo and kind of draw further on Melinda Terry's comments regarding uh, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan process. If you go and you look at the website right now today, they're still listed the Delta Habitat Conservation and Conveyance Planning Committee, which I'm guessing now is the new executive committee that we heard about on the Metropolitan Water District uh, meeting as of last week, but I don't know. So I don't know who the members are on that committee. I see an empty schedule. I don't know when their meetings are. I don't know if we can, if, if just someone from a grassroots organization can observe those meetings, participate, speak, not speak, or if someone of Melinda's status who was more in, intimately involved with the BDCP has the ability to attend. I don't understand what the relationship is between that committee and the 14 new working groups that have been proposed. I don't understand what the relationship is then between that policy committee and this new uh, management committee and if those meetings are going to be placed online. I'm heartened to hear that there have been over 300 meetings or 500 meetings, numerous meetings since January for the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. I'd love to see a schedule and I'd love to know how the public can participate. All right, thank you for your comments. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is Tim Quinn. I'm the executive director of the Association of California Water Agencies. ACWA, as you know, is a very diverse organization, although here I have even a broader uh, set of diverse interests to talk about them here, particularly to speak as a signatory and an organizer of three letters that we sent to the Delta Stewardship Council. I believe copies have been made, uh, made available. And I, I will be, I'll try to keep to the 60 seconds. Um, the chairman of the Delta Stewardship Council in response to a question from Member Olson said, the, the legislature told him to reg regulate, he has no choice. We believe that they do have a choice. And that the re legislature was actually trying to get them to, to go a much less regulatory route uh, and we think that, that uh, the, the choice they're making is ar arguably fatal and none of us can afford for it to be fatal. Suffice it to say we will continue working with uh, the chairman and the other members of the council to try and find changes to a, uh, uh, to a Delta plan that that very broad coalition of interests that ranges from the Oregon border down to the Mexican border. There are no bases left untouched. The Sacramento Valley is there, San Joaquin River Tribs, Mountain Counties, uh, the Sacramento area, which does more conservation than they get credit for, uh, even so, some uh, of Aqua's members in the Delta, Bay Area agencies, Southern California, and the export interest, they are all there uh, with grave concerns, uh, but willing to support a package that, that that's going to work. I can't resist a comment on some of these flow related issues because uh, it disturbed me a lot listening to a lot of the uh, of the back and forth this notion somehow that that regional self sufficiency uh, and that reduced reliance means we have to accept less supply conveyed across the delta than under the currently very depressed levels as we struggled with endangered species and the wrong physical system to manage them that notion is also a potentially fatal flaw the the fact is aqua members all all across this state are not waiting for the other agencies to act. They are acting now. They are developing local resources. By uh, DWR's estimate, we're on the path towards, towards making two, almost two and a half million acre feet of water available from local resources, but it's not enough to solve the problem. Do you problem. mind me asking you a question about that, no. Mr. Quinn? Because I, I, I'm just a little bit vexed by that. I mean, you were here when we wrote the statute. You were here when... I presented it in committee and on mm -hmm. the floor and when statements were made. You were at the signing ceremony where I stood next to Arnold Schwarzenegger and we talked about this quite specifically, that what this meant was that in the future less water would be exported from the Delta than in the past. It just couldn't have been more clear. And now somehow that's being seen as, as a, a, a tortured interpretation of, I mean, this is the law. It's another, I've been through more baseline arguments in my career than anybody should have to go through. And that's what we're going through here now. One side was seeing a baseline as being current Delta deliveries. Another one was seeing the future and what your, and what your demands would be relative to what they otherwise would have been. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, Aqua is, 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 in, is in the latter camp. The notion that you're going to get to closure and have a complete comprehensive program with all the financing for the Delta restoration that needs to happen happen and reduce supplies, when you reduce supplies, you just reduce your financial capabilities. 
Uh, and I, Mr. Chairman, would love to engage yeah. in a public debate. Let's put some numbers to this. Let's talk about how you get Let's more read equality. Read the act too while we do it because it's pretty clear. And I think the act is. <laughs> I also think the act is uh, is clear, although we seem to have clarity around different interpretations <laughs> of the act. Um, anyway, I'm sorry I didn't mean but, to, but, to take you uh, off. It, uh, it's important for the committee to understand. In the last, in the last panel, the notion size was somehow a proxy for amount of delivery. Now, that's not totally without some merit, but but the fact is that's not what Delta conveyance is really about. Delta conveyance is about reducing conflict between delivering water and the and the well-being of species. When you spend those billions of dollars, you have a system that has inherently less conflict between your operations, and you can get some of that water back in a manner that is entirely consistent with co-equal goals. And and that has got to be a part of uh, of what we're focusing on. If that's if that's left out of the equation, we are certainly left on a path that goes nowhere. Okay. Thanks for your comments. Welcome. I guess this is on. Yes. My name is Dick Poole. I am a fishing equipment manufacturer, and I'm here on behalf of the salmon fishing industry today. I just had a couple quick points I'd like to to make. As you all know, the salmon fishing industry has suffered probably as bad as any agricultural area. We've been uh, shut down for three years now. There's a new lawsuit trying to shut us down for another year. We are hurting badly. Um, I would like to thank this committee for its continued oversight. Uh, I, ever, I have attended a number of these meetings and I see progress every time uh, we are moving ahead. I would also thank, like to thank uh, uh, <coughs> Dr. Merrill and Secretary Laird for their generous time. We have spent a lot of time with them. We were not involved in the BDC process. We are a stakeholder that we feel sometimes forgotten, and they have been very gracious in their time. And they, they initially said to us that we know what the water contractors want. We don't know what you people want. And we have put a plan together that we are shopping, and we want to talk to a lot of people in this room on particularly short-term actions. Um, Phil Eisenberg recommended the, the interim plans. We desperately need some interim plans. The salmon fishery is continuing to dwindle. A lot of these fish are in very desperate shape uh, and we think there's some actions. Some of them take some money, some of them take some water, some of them take no water. But I just wanted to say we are one of those that we hope we can uh, talk to a lot of people and, and develop some interim plans to begin to turn this situation around right. in the near future. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's always great to be uh, last. Uh, you can tell everybody uh, wants to go do something else. So uh, <laughs> let me just uh, touch on a couple of uh, quick uh, points here, and there's been a lot of conversation. Uh, first thing, I uh, just want to emphasize, I'm David Guy with Northern California Water Association. Uh, first thing, just want to emphasize the importance of regional sustainability and the concepts that I think are embodied to that of meeting water needs for, for all of the various purposes within uh, the various regions. And then I think the second point on the uh, Delta plan, let me... Uh, uh, build on some of the comments that uh, Mr. Quinn made. Um, in my view, the uh, particularly focusing on the Delta plan, um, in my view, it's strayed a little bit, and uh, we think there's an opportunity to bring it back into focus. Those two areas that I think we would recommend bringing it back into focus is to focus more on the Delta, uh, and the second would be to avoid duplication with other entities that are already undertaking some of these uh, efforts. So I'll uh, stop there and, of course, would welcome uh, further discussion on that as more time permits. Terrific. Well, thank you all for your comments. Thanks, everybody, including the members and staff, for uh, participating in this hearing. And we're going to let everybody uh, get out of here right at 12 o'clock sharp. So thanks very much. Tim, you should have pointed out you even came over yeah. from your meeting. Your <laughs> I, I did, yes.